Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to New Worlds November. This is a new BookTube event for the month of November where I am being joined by a bunch of other great BookTubers. The event was created by uh, Scott and Becky at the Bookish Bryants, and it's uh, to celebrate science fiction. And for New Worlds November uh, 2021, we're celebrating science fiction short stories uh, in all of their many forms. <laughs> there are so many of them that to help narrow things down and maybe control the profusion just a little... Uh, we've come up with prompts, very, very general prompts, and the first week of the month is Aliens. That is that that is the prompt for just this week. Uh, and that's good for me, because the project that I am doing, sort of, everybody's going at New Worlds of Ember in their own different way. The project that I'm doing is to look at the square-bound pulp periodicals that are still being published, that are full of science fiction stories every month. Uh, that's how I would argue a large chunk of science fiction and a large chunk of science fiction careers got started in the first place, was in magazines like that, either these same magazines or their forerunners. Uh, so I thought what I would do for New Worlds November in 2021 would be to look at the magazine of science fiction and fantasy, Analog and Asimov's, for this year. So I'd go back to, you know, the December, the January, February issue and just look forward move through every one of those issues. Um, and in week number one, I am going through those issues looking for alien stories. Every one of those, well, we saw the other day, I showed you the latest issue of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, and that's the half of that table of contents usually is science fiction. The other half is fantasy. So that cuts the number down right there. Uh, and in the latest issue, the one that I showed you, I I could I haven't done an actual head count, but I could swear that the number of fantasy stories out, outnumbered the number of science fiction stories. Maybe that number is not hard and fast. Maybe that varies back and forth from month to month, from issue to issue. Uh, but of course, with Analog and Asimov, it's all science fiction. But even so, that is not going to overwhelm us because, for instance, I'm looking here at the January-February issue of Asimov's. A Rocket for Demetrius is the uh, the cover story with the illustration of the character engaging in uh, a very mechanical, very medical, very strenuous form of telepathy of a kind. A kind of telepathy that really is, that could be scientifically possible, where you're reading the, the folds of a person's brain and you're losing time the longer they're dead, the harder it is to do. Uh, <laughs> and Rocket for Demetrius features many, many unlikely things, including Eleanor Roosevelt as a, para, a paratrooping action hero. But as bizarre as that is, it's not technically alien. <laughs> I went through this issue. And there aren't many stories in here that are about aliens. So what's going to happen in the course of November uh, is that we're going to go back to these issues four times. I, am I went through this issue looking for alien stories. There were two. Uh, but next week will be a different prompt. I'll be right back to this to this issue. Uh, for this issue, though, uh, the two stories are very interesting for some of the broader discussions that we could have about science fiction short stories. I mentioned the main item uh, when I kicked off no, New Worlds of my New Worlds of our videos. I kicked off with a discussion about one of the things that you look at in any science fiction, uh, in any short story of any genre. And that is one of the ways in which it, re it chooses to reflect our, the era in which it's written, or chooses not to. Um, not necessarily to say that it's bad that it does that. I, I, maybe maybe it, was weak, it was a weak example for me to start off with such a poor story. Because all, a lot of science fiction short stories do that, and a lot of them do it in very interesting ways. And even when they don't give you an interesting twist on things, uh, the... the uh, just the, the elements alone that are imported from the present day will still be an element of interest. I mean, Rocket for Demetrius, I thought was, uh, I mean, it's their marquee story here. And I thought it was, it was pretty good. It's kind of a, a counter history. Uh, but it barely uh, weaves in the present at all. Whereas the two, one of the two stories that I want to talk about very much does. Uh, one of the two stories here is... Uh, by Robert Chase, and it's called The Three-Day Hunt. Uh, and it, it, its opening, its premise, is very normal. There is a man, Sergeant, uh, uh, Sergeant Hammond, I think his name is. Yes, Sergeant Hammond, uh, is back from Afghanistan. He's back from service in Kabul, where he and his squad encountered a tripwire IED. And it didn't kill him, 
but it did fill his leg with shrapnel, and it killed a couple of members of his team, and it would maybe have killed them all if they hadn't had a local dog who was trying to warn them. And it, it destroyed one of those dogs, one of that dog's legs. And uh, Sergeant Hammond uh, brings, pulls in a whole bunch of favors in order not only to get himself cleaned up, but to get that dog sent back to the U.S. with him. Uh, I'm not sure about that aspect of it, because it seems like every returning vet has a story about pulling in favors to get a dog back to the United States with them. I, I'm glad that people do that, obviously. But uh, when Sergeant Hammond gets back home, uh, he's haunted by what happened to him. He's, he has nightmares. He is clearly depressed. He's clearly suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, what we would now call that, where he can't get over the death of his men. He can't get over his own survival. He can't get past that. There's a great moment early in the story where uh, his wife is telling him, well, you know, you're, you, it can't go on like this. Your little son is afraid for you. And Sergeant Hammond thinks to himself, no, he's afraid of me. And he decides to take the dog who is, he is called Tripod, because the dog has one artificial leg and three natural legs. He takes the dog to his cabin, way out in the woods, way up in a, 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 the escarpment of, of a mountain in the woods, in order to recover. Uh, which I don't know that would be, would be completely medically advisable, and certainly the PC way to do it, but he does it anyway. And the, the store, one of the stories rather heavy-handed concessions to just ordinary bug-eyed monster shoot 'em up science fiction is that a alien spaceship that looks like a flying saucer lands crash lands right near his cabin that that's one that's one tiny way in which you know that the author of the short story doesn't want to bother with any with rethinking any of those standards because the author has other things on his mind and you can grant that. If the author has other things on their mind, then you have to pay attention to what they do have on their mind. In the one example that we saw before, the author clearly did have something on her mind, but it turned out not to be all that worthwhile. You know, yelling at you, scolding you, is not all that worthwhile a meta thing to have on your mind, I don't think. Uh, but when you see a detail like that where a guy is alone in the woods and it just so happens that an alien flying saucer crashes to Earth right near his house... You know, though that's also easy, that the author must have a different point to make. Sergeant Hammond goes to the flying saucer. It is cracked open. There, it is, it is pretty clear that something that wasn't human was in there. The furniture inside the thing doesn't look like it would accommodate a human. Uh, and that that thing has left. And he and Tripod track the inhabitant of that flying saucer. Tripod, of course, is much, much more effective at this than Sergeant Hammond is. Uh, it was a detail when I was reading the story. I was thinking, okay, well, this is really well done. Uh, and, of course, that would be true. Also, all the details, uh, uh, all the outside details are really good. Uh, like, for instance, we get this bit that any of you... Uh, it's it, Tripod picked up the scent just before they emerged from the trees. The ground became steeper as they proceeded. Then suddenly they were in the open. The ground dropped away in what was almost vertical enough to be termed a cliff. Hammond scanned the descent carefully for a safe way down. This far from civilization, a twisted ankle would be just as fatal as tumbling to his death. I read that and and uh, thought immediately, yeah, that, that this person's whoever Robert Chase is, he's hiked he's hiked out in the country, uh, long a long way from your truck, a long way from the trailhead, a long way from a city. That that is absolutely true. You have to be careful. You have to do uh, precautionary walking because if you have a big problem, you're going to have to deal with it on your own. Uh, so that, that was a really neat detail. This book is full of, uh, of details like that. And the whole time that we're in the story, uh, while they are tracking this, this being from the flying saucer, at first, uh, Sergeant Hammond isn't sure that it's a being. He, at first, he thinks, well, logically... It's a human testing an experimental aircraft. Logically, why well, don't think of zebras? In other words, logically, it, it would be a human. But he quickly becomes quickly becomes aware, not only through the evidence on the ground, but also through Tripod's reactions, that it isn't a human being. And also, he quickly becomes aware through radio or you know phone communication that the U.S. government knows that something crashed near his home. They've done a full background check on him. They know who he is. And they're trying to get in touch with him to tell him they are searching for the occupant of this craft, and finding the occupant of this craft without the government is way above your pay grade. 
and he doesn't answer them. He doesn't talk to them. He listens to their messages, but he doesn't talk to them. One of the one of the people they talks to uh, give is uh, is not technically uh, in the ranks. Her name is Doctor Olivia Durant, and she gives him a canned speech. Uh, I've been looking over your file. I see that you served two terms in Afghanistan and that you have been com uh, commended for bravery several times. I also see that you had a hard time at the end of your last tour and since you have come home. I want you to know that, what, that you have nothing to prove. Locating and contacting this alien is a burden you do not have to bear. We are here to do that. Just let us know where you are. We'll pick you up. The information you have gathered may be of immeasurable help to us. Uh, and Hammond thinks to himself, she's really good. <laughs> uh, the words have been carefully chosen to sway a weary non-com. This is a problem for the brass. Let them deal with it. And the careful use of the word may in the information you have gathered may be of immeasurable help. I refuse to overpromise. See how honest I'm being with you? But not only does he not answer, he takes the battery out of his phone. And I, I, to that, I want to point out two things, right? When you're reading the story, you will, you will encounter that and you will think two things. The fact that our hero was in Afghanistan, that is an, an explicitly topical reference to, to modern news, and also the fact that our hero could be an enlisted man who absolutely does not trust his own government. That also is, is a reflection, an echo of, of modern sensibilities that the author is putting in his story. He's putting it there intentionally. So that you get to the end of the story and you know that the government is looking for this guy and you don't know what's going to happen. What, what, what was her name again? Dr. Olivia Durant. She says, just let us pick you up. The information you have may be valuable. In Read in a 2021 lens, that could easily be a death threat. You don't know. You, if you encountered that, if, the, if the, the government did find Sergeant Hammond, and pick him up, and you were reading that story, and they kill him, drop him out of a helicopter, you wouldn't be surprised at all as a reader. That is, that is part of our modern sensibility. So uh, that's another way. And eventually, at the end of the story, Sergeant Hammond and Tripod do find the alien. It's been wounded. It was wounded in the crash, so it can't keep going forever. Eventually, they find it, and it is cautious. It has a weapon. It also has a rudimentary translating device. Uh, and they approach it, and it's only at the in the final scene that the reader realizes is one of the big reasons why the alien is cautious. It's because the two different species are working together seamlessly. They're talking to each other. They're working as one person. If you've ever, again, any of you who have ever been out in fields, out hunting, out hiking with dogs that are attuned and trained to be with you, will know what that feels like. It is very much an active communication. It is not you anthropomorphizing. Uh, and I want to read you just a bit here at the end here. There are achievements humans commonly use to explain or justify their dominion over the planet. Taming fire, inventing language and mathematics, material and intellectual tools of obvious power and importance. You would not normally put domesticating dogs in the same category. To humans, it just seems like the natural thing to do. But maybe in the universe at large, it was rare or even unique. Uh, to force this sort of partnership, you have to see a different species as something other than competition or food, or uh, a competition for food or food itself. Uh, the alien was trying to deal with that concept. The alien, when it points its translating device at them, points out that the dog is neither food nor competition, and seems confused by that. Uh, it occurred to Hammond that the injured alien might find it intimidating to have a human looming over him. He held out his hand, palm up to the alien, just to show he had no weapons. He told Tripod to sit, and then, groaning softly, joined him on the ground. Uh, and he tries to assure the alien, who does have rudimentary translating ability, that he means it no harm. And that this isn't as unusual as it seems. But, but uh, the writer, what's his name again? Robert Chase? Robert Chase can't let it go, so he goes on just a little bit more, uh, because Hammond introduces himself, and he introduces Tripod, uh, and he has to he try he tries to explain it. He says, "My partner here is Tripod. He's a dog. His folk and mine go back a long way, so long, in fact, that we don't have a record or even a memory of how it started. The partnership has us has some ups and downs over the years, but overall, it's been good for both." And that was, that's Hammond talking, but then the author steps in. Humans had spread all over the earth, and they had taken dogs with them. What may have started as a food or a guard dog service exchange had grown into much more. Dogs as herders and hunting partners. 
Dogs who could find people trapped in wreckage or sniff out the beginning of cancer. Dogs whose presence could soothe away nightmares. That's why Hammond has brought Tripod with him to this to this cabin in the woods. That's why, to heal himself. Uh, and as, he, as humans had modified dogs, there was an unlooked-for change in humans themselves. People who liked dogs and partnered with them were more successful than those who didn't. People changed dogs who changed people, each becoming more useful than the other. There was probably a word for that, but Hammond could not bring it to mind. Uh, that is wonderful. I love that moment. I also love the fact that Robert Chase has presence of mind, considering the doubt he's reflected in his own story about the U.S. Army, he has a presence of mind in that last scene to have Sergeant Hammond see not only a government helicopter, a black speck in the air coming towards them, but also to see there's a star on the horizon the opposite direction that's moving, <laughs> that is also coming towards them. <laughs> so there's going to be a negotiation of some kind or other. This is a first contact, but it's not necessarily that, that Sergeant Hammond is going to be black helicoptered. It, the alien has people too. And the story is just started from there. Another great aspect of short stories is when you feel like not only has a point of some kind, I know that's a very pedestrian way to put it, but not only do you feel that you have seen a dramatic breath, I always think of short stories that way, a dramatic breath of some kind, but also that it leaves you expecting the next breath, wanting the next breath. I absolutely love that, although that is not a universal in short stories, as we'll see in the other, the other alien short story in this issue is by Robert Reed a name that's going to come up a lot this month, because he's a great science fiction short story writer. Typically, in any issue of Asimov's or Analog, no matter how many big names you have uh, on the list of authors, no matter how many people have won how many Nebula Awards or whatever, typically his story will be not only the best story in that issue, but by a, far, by a wide margin, the best story in that issue. And he has a story in this issue that is also an alien story. Uh, it's very, very different, though. Uh, yeah, there's a story by Fran Wilde called Mayor for Today. A guy answers an ad to be a mayor for one day of a city on in, in, uh, the other side of the world. And the story is uh, a very, very good uh, short story take, sort of satire on the gig economy. It's a very, very good. But it, it's a sociological science fiction story, right? There are a lot like that. And you'll keep in mind, uh, if you're sticking to our four prompts, then we will never look at that story. We, it's not part of any one of our prompts. It's not AI. It's not dystopia. It takes place in the present day. No aliens. Uh, and no time travel. And that happens. That's going to happen in every issue of Asimov's and Analog. Is there are going to be stories that are definitely really good science fiction, but that don't fall into our prompts. They'll all have to wait until... New World's November 2022. <laughs> the other story in here that deals with aliens is by Robert Reed. It's long. It's called The Realms of Water. Uh, and it's a great ship story. That is a, a sort of a, a concept that runs throughout a lot of his stories. It really is not prohibitive or exclusive at all. It took me a while to remember when I was done with this story. It took me a while to remember that it was a great ship story. You're going to get a story. Whether you know anything about his concept of the great ship or not, I would say you don't even need to look it up. You don't even need to Google it because it's not important to the story. Uh, what is important to the story is the comment that he makes in his opening remarks uh, where he said that at one point or another when he was studying ancient Rome, he wondered what the story of Hannibal and the Carthaginian army's use of elephants would be like in war against Rome if we could get the elephants version of the story. <laughs> and that... It, that germinated and changed and metamorphosed in his writer's mind into a story about uh, the grand many, about the 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 uh, weird aliens uh, in this story. They're they're kind of sort of able to make contact with humans, but they're much bigger than humans. They're much different than humans. It's it's Robert Reed uh, extraterrestrializing the idea of an elephant. So the, the wisdom is there, but it's drastically different. The cognition is there, but it's drastically different. The physiology is there, but it's drastically different, drastically superior in lots of ways. And it's the, the story of this alien, this alien species, long-lived, virtually indestructible, called the Grand Many, and their interaction with the far more human-like inhabitants of their world, who go to war with them, 
not just fighting against them, but using them on their side in their wars against their other humanoid enemies. Uh, and the, we, we are introduced to one of the Grand Many uh, because there's a tourist bus, basically on an extraterrestrial world, the Grand Many's world. There's a tourist bus with a bunch of tourists of, that are just looking at this world and sort of clandestinely hoping that maybe they'll spot one of these giant stone beings called the Grand Many. Uh, they, they don't know if they will or not. They're just in it for the fun of it when the vehicle breaks down. And they're not sure, you know, how long is it going to be until help can get here? Can we repair the vehicle on our own? And one of the members of the, this tourist group decides to go out wandering and encounters one Grand Many who has his long story to tell. The bulk of the story is that Grand Many member telling his story to this individual. And the reason why the individual doesn't run screaming is because the individual herself is very different from human. She is human, but she's 40,000 years old. She And unbeknownst to the other beings in her tour bus. So, so you've got strange meeting strange. And some of that, there, there's one, I think I counted one element of that, that will make more sense if you know about the great ship, if you read some of those stories. But it is perfectly contextualized in this story, so it's not like it matters. It won't matter. You'll get a little bit extra. Uh, that's the other alien story, and it is uh, off topic of the kinds of themes that we're talking about today for two reasons. One is because it's strange meeting strange. It's not a normal human meeting an alien, and the other is because it absolutely is not concerned with topical references at all. The closest it comes is the Second Punic War. That's as close as you get to a topical reference. Instead, it's just world building. Just a, what, uh, what what a certain strand of science fiction short story does, which is to just push your imagination to the limits and then let you go. Uh, so, and those were the two alien short stories in this issue. So we're going to move on to another issue uh, tomorrow. I've received permission from Scott and Becky <laughs> to make a, do a great many videos. That's what I intend to do. It was a lot of fun to do this. It's good to revisit these things through the lens of the prompts for this event. Uh, and to make me realize, you know, how many topics have suffused the science fiction short story market that aren't dealing with aliens. Uh, so we'll see what we find tomorrow. <laughs> we'll move on to another issue. I'll go to analogs next for the first for the first two months of the year. But in the meantime, I'm going to wrap this up. I will try to remember to leave a hashtag so you can find all sorts of other New Worlds November videos because they'll they'll be going up. <laughs> You'll be see it won't just be me. You'll be seeing lots of such videos. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up for now. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, Book Team.